I think people have um, uh, been led to believe that everything has to be expensive to be good, and that's not necessarily true. Uh, for fractions of the cost of, of a single employee, uh, a company can have our technology in there that does the work of 10 people on a daily basis. Remember when I told you it takes 15 reports to put together the kind of summary that we provide every morning at 6 a.m.? Think about the people that that, the, t- the people in time that that takes to, to make happen. A quick interruption to mind you to like, subscribe, and rate this podcast so we can get your feedback and know how to make it better. Hey, it's Ari Santiago. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Made in America podcast. We're going in a little bit of a different direction and one that is near and dear to my heart. I'm with John Joseph, founder and CEO of Datanomics, a data analytics company right for manufacturing. I am so excited to hear his story. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks for having me. Well, John, listen, it's the Made in America podcast. So we always start off with the same two questions. What do you make and why do you make it? Yeah, we, we've developed an elegant piece of software that is uh, custom built for manufacturing, industrial uh, companies. Uh, and we take a data stream that is, uh, comes off of these machine tools that are in these factories, factories with 50 to 100 um, machine tools. We connect to that data stream, we process that data, and we focus on a production score, which is benchmarking of their jobs that are being manufactured in real time and putting that production score up on a TV screen, broadcasting it across the floor and getting people to rally around, getting production scores up across the, the floor and increasing output, increasing efficiency, all the positive things people are looking for. Listen, there's a ton to unpack in there, uh, and I'm excited to do it, but let's talk about the why. Sure. So why this business? Why this industry? I mean, you know, you didn't start off in manufacturing, right? right? I mean, you're coming out of you're coming out of the, the the Ari Santiago history world of data. I mean, you worked for Dell, Equalogic. Um, you know, you've been in storage, high tech, uh, and, and now in manufacturing. Give us the why. How'd you get here? Uh, I graduated with a mechanical engineering degree from an engineering school in Massachusetts, uh, worked in a machine shop on the weekends, earning money, uh, so extra scratch so that I could pay for things at our house, newly married, et cetera. And I uh, was working in the computer industry and, uh, you know, means to an end. And so I worked uh, as a design engineer for about seven years, and then I moved into marketing and, and selling of technology. Uh, was acquired three times, digital equipment to Quantum, Quantum to Mac Store. Uh, equal logic to Dell. So I've been through three acquisitions, um, very successful ones, mm-hmm. uh, each time taking on broader responsibilities and taking on more work and um, uh, bigger deliverables, bigger goals. Um, I also come from a family of manufacturers. So my my father, uh, who grew up in Springfield, Massachusetts, was uh, in the manufacturing business for 30 years. Um, when he was in high school, he worked at Springfield Armory and told us stories about heat treating gun barrel uh, gun barrels at Springfield Armory. Uh, during the uh, World War II, his sisters worked at Pratt and Whitney in Hartford on drill presses, uh, making aircraft engines for fighters and bombers. So I grew up in a manufacturing family. Talked about it all the time. Uh, it's just it's it's in my it's in my DNA. In your DNA and the blood. Yeah. And the, so and the whatever I can it, sort of hear the conversations. Yeah. Right. So as I rotated out of IT and was looking for kind of the next thing, uh, data analytics and surrounding myself with people who understood data analytics and going after a new segment that was data rich, that was ripe for reinvention seemed logical to me. So let's talk a little bit um, about that. Um, First of all, I just want to make this larger point, which is, is something that's come up over and over again on the podcast is people finding their way back into manufacturing from from finance, from from fine arts, from marketing, uh, and from uh, uh, high tech uh, IT, which is which is just so cool. Mm-hmm. Um, so I love seeing that. So talk a little bit about. Let's get into that data part of it a little bit, right? I mean, you know, there's so much data being generated by these machines, right? As we've moved into, you know, sort of CNC and more high tech machines, they're generating gobs and gobs of data. But we haven't been able to kind of harness the data, I don't think, to its maximum potential. Is that what sort of inspired Datanomics and uh, Datanomics and, and got it going? Yeah, it is. Uh, actually, uh, there are 25,000 companies in North America that uh, have 
uh, large manufacturing machinery that produces the kinds of data that we uh, process and, and turn into our fusion software product. Um, it's a multi-billion dollar market. Uh, and actually is dwarfed by Europe and, and Asian uh, companies who are even orders of magnitude larger than that. So there's a huge opportunity here to uh, take this, uh, this latent data that's being emitted from these machines and turn it into insights and actions for factory owners. I think the thing that is very important about what we do is we're talking to an audience that, is an, that, that, that are experts at subtractive and additive manufacturing. And when they think about data, it's a little bit daunting. And so how do you put information uh, and take your, your years of experience with information technology and apply it to an audience that's focused on cost of goods sold, that's focused on customer deliveries, quality, the Kaizen Toyota process and lean manufacturing, continuous improvement. That, that's, that topic of information technology, of, of, of knowledge base uh, in their factories is not at the, it doesn't make the top of that priority list. So we're, we came at this looking at how to make the consumption of information simpler for the user. And as I talked about a minute ago, using the IT background around simplicity, ease of use, and integration is something that they, that they absolutely need. And when they see our product, a light goes off and they say to us, how did, how did you guys know this, that this is the way we think? you developed a product that is a mirror image of the way I manage my business. It takes me 15 reports to generate the information you guys put on a single screen. So we know we're on the right track. We've delivered something of value. So let's see if we can explain that. Cause it, it, it's, it's, you know, I think it's important. Sure. Um, and so let's get into it a little bit. Cause I, I know the scoring is big. So sure. let's, let's see if we can explain, exp maybe before we get to that. Everyone talks about Industry 4.0 and the embracement of IT as the next kind of iteration of manufacturing, and, and, and I'm among those people, sure. right? I've, I've often talked about the businesses that didn't embrace Toyota production system, that didn't embrace Lean and Kaizen and, and that type of manufacturing. Those manufacturers aren't around anymore. Sure. The manufacturers that didn't embrace new manufacturing technology, that didn't embrace the CNC movement, that didn't embrace that new technology – they're, they're basically not around sure. uh, anymore. And my thesis is that the manufacturers that don't begin to embrace ro Industry 4.0, robots, cobots, um, data analytics, mm -hmm. and leveraging the data we have to become more efficient, they're not going to be around in the future. What do you think about my thesis? It's absolutely right. I call it digital leverage. Uh, digital leverage because if you don't have the information uh, with you as you're uh, working through the floor, the factory floor over the course of the day, uh, you're, 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 you don't have a guidance system. You, you need a guidance system to be successful. Uh, the picture that I draw for people is uh, one of 100 CNC machines in a factory, a single factory floor. You've got five to six manufacturing engineers who come to work every day and they figure out what, what do I need to do to meet customer deliverable goals and objectives? Where do they go? So what's the first question you ask? Um, we talked to some customers as part of founding this company and the focus groups that we led. And they said, I listen for vibrations. I smell smoke. I see fire. So I just go in that direction. And if that's your mantra of how you're going to conduct your, your day, you're destined to not make it to your point. And so our Fusion software produces this guidance system, which overlays on top of that floor of 100 machines uh, areas that are hotspots. So our production score is a key piece of that. If you're getting an A or an A plus on your job that's being manufactured, leave that job alone. That job is going to be just fine at the end of the day. It's going to meet objectives. If you're getting a B minus or a C plus or a C minus, it's just a simple grading system. That job's in trouble. And so what we found, um, and there's an obvious question of, will people think this is Big Brother watching them? The answer is no. What we found is that when we put these TV screens, 70-inch TV screens on the floors, up in the ceilings, on the walls, and production workers uh, who are experienced production workers see that someone is having trouble, they go over to help. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a whole different mentality. Rather than listening to music while they're going through their cycle on their part and waiting for the 
uh, cycle stop to, to come up and then open the door, remove chips, remove the part, put in a new chip, uh, put in a new uh, block of aluminum. They're helping other guys uh, achieve what they need to achieve uh, on the floor. So data analytics is the future. The sooner you embrace it and run with it, the more successful you're going to be. And we're able to measure that with the customers we're talking to. It's perfect. So let's, let's dig into that. I, listen, could not agree with you more. Data is power. It certainly is. Data is power, but you, but it's only powerful if we can make sense of it. Sure. Right. If, if you're just covered in tons and tons of data, it's, it's meaningless. Sure. But when you aggregate the data and do something meaningful with it that you can act on to make a positive impact, boy, that's better, right? Better than waiting to, for the fire to happen. But to see a trajectory, you see an A to an A minus to a B plus, hey, we got to go the other direction. And you can celebrate the successes going in the right Absolutely. direction. Absolutely. Especially with new employees. Absolutely uh, love it. Let's talk about this. You talk about the grading system. You The Fusion software that you guys developed, you look at it to put it a score. Explain how that score works. How can you get enough from just the machine to help make that score? Yeah, so I, I think I need to explain a couple of things first. One is that when we were, uh, when we were uh, architecting the product, we asked uh, owners and vice presidents of operations and uh, production leaders what, we, what the things we could do and we couldn't do with uh, data input, data sources, because data is fuel, mm -hmm. right? You need fuel to develop this insight. What they told us was that they did not want machine operators doing data input. So please don't put tablets on my machines and ask my operators to, to use that as an input source. Uh, took a coffee break at 930, lunch at 1230, set up took six hours, and all of this stuff has to be input. It, it creates the wrong culture. It creates uh, the, uh, a, a series of erroneous inputs that nobody trusts, and the whole system is a house of cards that falls apart. The second thing they said is, um, please don't burden my ERP with more integrations. We understand our ERP. And as I look at ERP systems at these companies, they're essentially workflow, they're, they're workflow monitoring systems and they're accounting finance and purchasing triggers to tell customers your parts are ready and to order new raw materials and other supply, uh, supplies to run the factory. So leave my ERP system alone. And then the third piece was um, leave it anonymized. I don't need to call operators out for not uh, being able to deliver on what they said they were going to deliver. So we took those three inputs, no input from the operators, anonymous and no ERP integration. And we said, um, tell us three things. I asked three questions in the focus group that we ran. I said, if you could instrument your factory up with sensors, industry 4.0, where would you put them? And it wasn't about the sensors or where they would put them, but it informed us, my co-founder and I, it informed us about where they needed information. Where did it come from? What kinds of information do you need? And it got them talking about how they manage their business. The second question I asked them was, if you had to correlate the data between sensors, what correlations would you want to see? And they said, well, that's interesting, right? If, I'm, if I've got coolant, uh, issues over here. I've got filtration issues here. If I've got inbound uh, chiller water coming in over there, ambient temperatures that are out of control, it's more than just a machine utilization number. It now becomes the, uh, the uh, virtualization of the entire factory. And uh, this digital twin concept is more than just a digital twin of a part. It's a digital twin of the entire environment. And the third question I asked was, now that you have all this correlation data, how does it impact your business decision-making and the things that are KPIs for your business? What are your KPIs for your business? So again, it wasn't about sensors. It wasn't about correlation studies. It wasn't about KPIs. It was about, I need to get in the customer's mind to understand how he or she thinks about running their business. And we took that input from a half a dozen focus groups, went back and spent two years architecting a product checking back with the customer, architecting a product, checking back until we came up with, um, and we, we looked at conventional wisdom. What, it, what was conventional wisdom at the time? It was, it was um, utilization scores and machine monitoring. Well, essentially what I view as machine monitoring is basically taking a red, yellow, 
green light on top of a CNC machine and aggregating it on a TV screen and assigning a percentage to it of on versus off. If I told you you were making a turbofan blade for a jet engine and it usually runs at 39%, but today you're running at 37%, you'd look at me and you'd say, so? Not enough context. So I said to our engineering team, I said that we needed to create a production indices that tells production workers that they're on track uh, at speed or off course, off speed. And so our guys started to look at cycle times of parts. And so what we did was we transcended the machine utilization conversation and went up the stack and said, why don't we focus on the job? The job is what is most important to the owners of these companies because they have customers that they've committed part quantities to and these customers have bet their businesses on this is this company as a manufacturer. And so the production score became a triangulation of things like cycle time, machine utilization is an element of it. Not, it's not, not uh, insignificant. Entire. It's not right. the entire piece. It's an element. Um, parts count per hour, uh, alarm frequency, alarm heuristics. How many times does the machine allow uh, alarm over the course of a production day? And so we start to, it's, it's kind of proprietary, you know, um, we, we'd like to keep some of our trade secrets to ourselves, but we looked at those things and we built algorithms that said in this scenario, he's going to get this grade in that scenario, he's going to get that grade. And, and in that scenario, she's going to get that grade on that job. And so we started to do correlation studies. So how did the job run according to the algorithm algorithms that we predicted it would run right on? I mean, it took us several times to get it right and several customer meetings to get it right. Um, thank God for some great people in the industry because they saw the light that we had seen and were very helpful to us in forming our product early on. So, so uh, let great. me just stop and ask a quick question. Sure. It's an important piece there. So taking away a little bit from this, which is, or well, taking away a lot, but one of the pieces taken away is this wasn't a bunch of like IT nerds in a in a room just figuring it out. There was significant interaction along the entire way. I don't know if you want to call it iterative, you want to call it agile, um, you know, wh whatever you want to call it. But it was a it was a sort of a, you know, a manufacturing lingo, a continuous improvement Certainly. type of process that involved sort of like plan, do, check, act, like, right, that a PDCA approach to software development with some manufacturers to make sure that you were getting the score that was meaningful to them. Yes, absolutely. Uh, well put. I would add to that, that some of our best product features were ideas that people who had been in manufacturing for 30, 40 years gave to us. And so my, my, my uh, partner and I just talked to these guys. And I think there's a major um, piece for people doing startups around the power of observation is go to the manufacturing floor, sit there and watch people move through time and space and understand what it is they're trying to do. And then, taken mimic that back into your product. The point is that these people gave us ideas that we uh, made better. And if we thought it would, it had enough merit became part of our general software development effort. Um, we have a great software team and they're, they have the ability to take those years of enterprise, uh, it infrastructure development, which is about integration. It's about performance. It's about redundancy. It's about uh, integrity in data management uh, and apply that to manufacturing. It's fascinating what, when Listen, you take somebody. You're go, going to Gemba, right? Go where the action is uh, to go and do that. That's uh, critical to manufacturing. You guys embrace it and uh, certainly uh, yeah. it sounds like it helped. Yes. So so let's talk about the, the Fusion platform and this, this grade and why it's important for manufacturers to just do something like this in general. So the idea being that who are we feeding the data to? Is this... Is this owners? Is this production managers? Is it production team? Like, how are we going to, how does manufacturing get better by embracing this type of data analytics? Sure. Uh, answer to the first question is that we're feeding it to everyone in the company. Uh, it unifies, we, what we've seen is that it unifies people uh, in the front office, you know, where the leadership team is, production meetings, and the entire uh, factory floor. So uh, by putting this in several of the factories we've installed it in, large TV screens for everyone to see, not hiding anything. Uh, we've seen adherence to cycle time improve by 20%. First parts produced, because that's one of the elements that we track 
as part of this analysis that we do. If the shift starts at 7 p.m. at 7 a.m., we were seeing first parts produced at 8:45. Do the math on $130 uh, per hour uh, shop cost. That's lost revenue. All of a sudden, you put that up for people to see. It starts to slide back towards 7 a.m. Or management comes in and says, what if we had a people, uh, person come into the uh, building at 6 a.m., an hour before the shift starts, to do warm-ups on the machines so that when the operators show up, their machine is warmed up, coolant levels are checked, filters are cleaned, let's get them started. It's about efficiency. That's mm-hmm. efficient. Uh, and so everyone sees it. Everyone participates. It's a unifying, uh, it's a unifying force in the company. How do people, how, so take a broader question about just having this data and using data to make good decisions. How would, put your kind of manufacturing business owner leader hat on, how should someone think about the ROI for putting in the effort to make this happen? Yeah. I think the most uh, concrete example I can give you is the people we spoke to over the last four years have told us that it takes me 60 to 90 minutes a day to assemble people, paper, and parts so that I get a picture of what's going on in the factory. And you give us a a report that you call your coffee cup report, which is it's emailed out at 6 a.m. in the morning. It's at the top of your email stack. It's a complete executive summary of what was produced in yesterday's production run. (laughs) And in five seconds, I can see exactly where my winners and losers are. Where do you think I'm going to spend my time? So I took that and I said, geez. I took that and I said, geez, um, how many re- reports do these people run that takes them all this time? And if we could give them back this time, what's that time worth? So I built an ROI calculator uh, with, uh, with our team. And it turns out that for the investment in our technology, you can recoup that in single digit weeks. Uh, and so you know, it's, um, the ROI is easy to calculate, very easy to calculate. How much, what is my time worth? Is my time better spent collecting data or is my time better spent growing top line? Yeah, there you go. Driving those. And listen, if you're getting more efficiencies, you're driving bottom line too. So that's not, it's not just about top line. So let's try and convert to something people can maybe grab onto. You've got some examples where this is, where this has worked. Why don't we share some of them? I, I, listen, I know you're sharing customer names, not asking for that, but just give us the breakdown. Like, you know, you, you talked about a factory with 100 machines. Do I have to have 100 machines? Do I have to have 500 machines, yeah. 20 machines? Where does this work? Give us some like, concrete examples sure. where it's worked. Yeah, so let's start with the large example. So uh, we, we have a customer uh, very close by that is uh, about 125 machines. Um, they have a, a number of very large government defense, and uh, commercial distribution customers that they make parts for. You can go to our website and read those case studies, excellent case studies about their experiences. They saw with the pandemic in 2020, um, ordering home goods, commercial goods, whatever, from uh, these large retail e-commerce platforms skyrocketed. The need for building warehouses nationally and globally grew exponentially. The demands put on these companies to build robotics devices to move this material around the country skyrocketed. How do you, how do you grow your company to meet that new demand? How do you do it in an organized way? Um, how do you get the most out of the equipment that you have on your factory floor to be able to deliver to the upside uh, forecast that you're getting from your, from your, uh, your customer? And so over the course of late 2019, 2020, this customer saw demand triple from what they were doing in in early 19. And so they deployed us across their entire factory floor because they needed that single seamless view of the factory uh, that was in production for those customers with that high demand so they could redeploy operators, train operators. And by the way, they had to hire 160 people in 2020 to meet that demand. Um, Bringing in new people, knowing where to dispatch those people, whether those people are being effective or not, your training needs, um, whether people are actually going to work out is all, all has to be measured, weighed, and calculated. We were a vital part of that. So big R, so uh, slim that down, 
big demand, want to manage the, mach- the shop floor overall, great way to zero in data to see where I need to deploy resources. Exactly. All right. So that's a large That's example. a large one. Let's talk about a smaller one. Um, a smaller one was a, a, a slightly smaller deployment, uh, had a very large medical business where they were building implant uh, plastic devices for spinal cord, shoulder, hip, and knee surgeries. With the pandemic, that slowed down. These discretionary surgeries, quote unquote, discretionary surgeries, um, had slowed down because of hospital situations. And what um, happened in parallel to that was massive increases in semiconductor demands. Just listen to Squawk Box and the NBC Nightly News or ABC Nightly News, whatever uh, news uh, channel you you go to, you can hear the the serious need for silicon to fuel demand for networks, 5G, et cetera. And they had to shift production from medical to their semiconductor uh, uh, practice. They um, had issues with people being in the factory. They needed to see every single machine in that factory. They asked us to come in and light up those machines on the semiconductor side. We left the, the medical uh, machines connected. Now they saw their semiconductor machines and it caused them to move an entire production operation over uh, to another side and do it uh, with full view of what was happening at all times. It's about awareness. It's about being able to measure output and to be able uh, to predict what you're going to be able to deliver to your customers at the end of a period. Is there any industry it doesn't work? Is there anywhere where, you, where you'd say, yeah, this industry 4.0 did analytics business, no, juice is not worth the squeeze? I haven't found it yet. I haven't found it yet. Uh, data is, uh, is very important to these people, regardless of your size. We, we have even smaller customers that are single digit machine counts in Connecticut where efficiency is everything because these screw turn machines need to be running 95, 96, 97% of the day, even unattended. So if, if you live down the street and the factory is empty at three o'clock in the morning and um, you want to see unattended uh, operation of that machine, we're a great solution for that. So, Give me, let's zoom out. So many great things here. Zoom out for a quick second and say, to get all this done, right? Tons of people in the audience don't fully understand the IT part of whatever. And sure. maybe in some cases are are afraid of it. And maybe afraid, no one wants to hear that. But, you know, intimidated, whatever, you know, don't want to waste their time with it. And they would say, well, listen, I don't want to spend, you know, millions of dollars buying, you know, brand new machines uh, to make this work, you know. What, what do you need to have happen to be able to lean into this technology? Sure. Let's start with the machines themselves. Um, anything that is vintage 2002, 2003 or later is fair game for- Newer. Newer. So it's produced in 2002 or 2003, which is nearly two decades ago. That's right. So that's, yeah. Has this capability to broadcast this parametric data off of the, the controller of that machine. Um if it doesn't, there are upgrade packages available from the machine manufacturers to do that uh, for low single digit thousands of dollars compared to the machine cost. That's a drop in the bucket. Um, it's a, a, a very simple co- a connection to the machine. It's an ethernet plug into the back of the controller. That controller has that data being emitted. We read that data through a wired or wireless connection. If it's wired, it's an IP address and we're ready to go. If it's wireless, we connect and start reading the data, verify that the data is correct and accurate, and we go from Ethernet plug into the controller of that machine to uh, usefulness to the customer, 24 hours. 24 hours. 24 hours. 24 hours. I just want to... The next day you're seeing... Next day you're getting... You're watching that job unfold. You're watching that job produce that part. Wow. It's it's not hard. It's like plugging in a new computer. Yeah, and I think the, the hardest part is for the people that we talk about, um, you know, being experts at additive and subtractive manufacturing, they think that their involvement in this process of data extraction, compilation, and um, expression is going to involve them. It's going to require their time. It's going to complicate their lives. It's going to get in the way of meeting demand. Zero involvement. Give us the creds to your, uh, your network. We log into your network and we start connecting machines and seeing the data. And then I get emails. And then the next morning at 6 a.m., you get your first email. How? So let's talk about beyond that, right? Sound, sounds great, right? Mm-hmm. And machines that exist, sure. taking a uh, you know an Ethernet cable or a wireless network, short money, plug it into the network I already have. 
anything I need to worry about from a technology standpoint beyond that? Like when you're out there, you know, look, I'll just call it right out. You know, being out there in the manufacturing environment, a lot of manufacturers, IT networks aren't up to snuff from what I've seen. Yeah. Yeah. Again, starting with the machine and working our way out. Um, if you are ordering a new machine uh, and um, there are options on that machine for data ports and power uh, availability, please do. Yeah, <laughs> Please do. You, you are going to need that data and you're going to need that power source regardless of whether you do business with our company or not. And I tell everyone that. Um, so that's down at the floor level. Uh, a solid network, a solid performant network with load balancing that uh, is able to move connections uh, across a wireless uh, mesh within that uh, that back end factory, critical, critical, critical because new machines are being developed every day, <clears throat> like CMMs, right, for quality control that communicate wirelessly to all kinds of different applications. So wireless, uh, having a solid wireless network uh, is imperative. And then um, the cost of computing has become so affordable that upgrading your PCs from X, uh, from uh, Windows 97 <laughs> uh, shouldn't be that hard. Yeah. Right? It shouldn't be that hard. It's so cost effective. And what you have to understand is there's a great multiplier effect by graduating your organization from Excel spreadsheets to modern uh, contextual data and um, all of the infrastructure that's included as part of that. What I also uh, have observed uh, are the number of companies who have inadequate IT services. Um, it's not about servicing the printers. It's about making sure your infrastructure is robust and supports your growth. If you're trying to grow top line and you don't have an IT infrastructure to support that top line growth, how are you doing that? You're just working yourself, not smarter, harder. Harder. It's unfortunate. Yeah, and listen, we got to maximize our investments in our people, in our physical plant, in what we're doing. And just like the physical plant's a lever, just like buying new machines is a lever, IT is one of those levers. I'm, I am so all in on that. Yeah. Um, and every other industry, you know, has figured it out. I think manufacturing could do a lot, could do a lot with it. And that goes back to the whole industry 4.0 lean in. And it's been on this podcast numerous times where we've talked to people, I think about the cruise manufacturing and they talked about one of their inflection points was when they realized, you know what, the money they were quote saving on secondhand machines and to try and save money in the nineties, when they made the flip and said, you know what, we're going to invest in the newer technology and the newer stuff. It made all the difference in the business. I mean, all Victor difference. says that, and I hear that story over and over. And we have, you know, Ron Angelo on from CCAT, or we have folks in, you know, from Constep or, or all the businesses. When you see what's working, they're leaning in Absolutely. to technology, Absolutely. not not being afraid of it. Advancements in manufacturing technology are amazing. Amazing the things people can do with uh, tools, tool life, tool path uh, optimization, uh, what I meant by tool life was tool life extension, mm -hmm. getting more out of your equipment, running your equipment better, smarter, f faster. It's just awesome. awesome. Yeah, that's more and more leverage, right? Uh, that you can get there. So listen, we're, we're getting we're getting a little bit out of time, John, but I want to kind of get through, maybe take this thing, zoom out a little bit, because I think you've got a unique perspective in that you built some very successful technology businesses. You sort of touched on uh, Equalogic, you touched on MaxTor, you touched on Dell businesses. I I've known super well from the from the outside. I think you mentioned to me offline. You're employee number thirty at Equalogic. Um, for anyone that's in the IT field, that's pretty impressive. That, that's a very important business in the in the IT space on the on the data side. Um, but you've also spent time doing focus groups. Thoughtful guy thinking about this industry. You got a sense of the number of businesses. I wonder if you could sort of give us your view of American manufacturing. You know, there's lots of talk about onshore reshoring, uh, the idea of supply chain management, the, the pandemic I think has done, you know, two things, well, a lot of things, but two things relative to this conversation, which is pushed a lot of technology forward, right? The, we got to work from home. We want to see stuff from home, you know, created adoption there. And it's also caused people to rethink supply chain yeah. and bring it closer. And I'm just, maybe you could opine on what you're seeing in the focus groups and the companies you're talking to, sure. um, and what you see for that future. Sure. Uh, the industry that I serve is uh, very healthy right now. Backlogs are as large as they've ever been for the uh, owners that I speak to on a daily basis. People are feeling really good about it, feeling really good about growth. 
Uh, and I think that that signal and other world forces uh, is uh, causing this, re- is driving this reshoring. And I think um, I'm probably going to go out on a limb a little bit here, but reshoring of our manufacturing, and to me, the equation goes like this reshoring of our manufacturing is about protecting intellectual property. And protecting this intellectual property is about uh, our national security. Uh, it is, it's, an, it's an imperative. It's not an option. We know, uh, again, watch the news outlets. We know there are bad act- actors out there. And so what we need to act, every single person has a responsibility to act to protect the intellectual property that, that this country produces. There are a lot of people that want what we have. We have to protect it. And so um, I see people building the infrastructure to make sure that they protect, uh, they build those moats uh, around, uh, around uh, what it is that we do uh, and, and do it effectively. I don't know how else to say it. I, I might have said too much. No, no, that's great. I, I, I mean, I love it. And, and I think, listen, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of the same stuff, right? I mean, you know, backlogs are up and I'm just going to re-beat this same drum again because I think, you know, just because people want to reshore, just because it is good for, for national security, it's good for the economy, it's good for business to operate, doesn't mean that buy American or do all that means we are absolved of having to make our businesses better and more efficient. Absolutely. It doesn't, it doesn't absolve us of that. And investing in technology and manufacturing across the board, the full suite of technology and inv- advancements, which starts off with you know, things like single piece flow, having the floor, the flow of your manufacturing floor designed right. Are your machines right? Your loading dock right? All that, all that matters. Do we have the right people? Are they being trained the right way? That all matters. Do we have the right machines and the right technology to build efficiently? That matters. Do we have the right IT, the right infrastructure? That matters. And are we getting the data that's out there? Because if we don't get the data and make the decisions, somebody else is is going to. Um, I'm going to make one other point, which I think people often don't think about. You know, businesses that have excelled and grown, and I, I think of Amazon, because you talked about robots and, 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 um, and shipping and storage, which, you know, uh, judging by the number of prime deliveries that come to my house, uh, you know, that's obviously on, on the rise. I think people know, and most don't, if they don't, how much robots are being used at Amazon to help, you know, pick and pack and, and do all that stuff, which no one did, right? Successful businesses are leaning into that technology. And if we want to maintain our supply base and our manufacturing here in Connecticut, we have to lean in. It isn't a should we, isn't it a can we, it is we must, and we have to figure out how, not if. Absolutely. Uh, I uh, is uh, preparing to come here to speak with you today. I, I saw a couple of your previous podcasts where you had interviewed people from uh, the ACM. Mm. And uh, I liked several of the things that I heard there from the, the Connecticut leaders that you had on that show, uh, that podcast. They talked about community. They talked about working together. They talked about coopetition. And there's, um, there's an underground network of connectivity between all of these companies in Connecticut that needs to be maintained. Uh, it maintained for everything you just described, don't need to repeat it, but also maintained to create the cultures, the organizations of the future that start welcoming in the 18, 25, 35 year old uh, operators of the future that want to come in and build the new uh, composition of the, uh, the new construct of the company. And um, it's, it's an, a highly integrated approach. It's not a single point solution. It's a highly integrated approach and it doesn't have to cost a lot. Talk about that a little bit more. That, that This seems like a great place to sort of wind up on. It doesn't sure. cost a lot. Um, I think people have um, uh, been led to believe that everything has to be expensive to be good, and that's not necessarily true. Uh, for fractions of the cost of, of a single employee, uh, a company can have our technology in there that does the work of 10 people on a daily basis. Remember when I told you it takes – 15 reports to put together the kind of summary that we provide every morning at 6 a.m. Think about the people that that, the, t- the people in time that that takes to, to make happen. Um, think beyond the sticker price of the thing that you're buying. Think about the ROI. Mm-hmm. Think about the things you don't have to do because you spent the $25,000 to have this software operational in your factory. Think about what your people can now go do because your production meetings every morning at 8.30 are actually production meetings. 
They're not people staring at their feet because they don't have answers. That's the key. And no one's debating about, well, the cycle times don't seem right. I'm not sure that, you know, Jane was properly logging that and Joe missed two days because he exactly. forgot to update the iPad. And exactly. we had the other tablet and the battery died. Someone dropped. Like, like we just free them up from that exactly. and, and get them running. This. Two, two things to that. Sure. Our product gets the data right from the controller. We're not asking anyone to interpret the data. And two, we're not an all or nothing game. Like Victor de Cruz has deployed us on half a dozen of his of machines at um, his uh, facility uh, here in Connecticut, and he could deploy us on six more, and then six more, and then six more. It's not a, it's not an all or nothing game. Add as you need it. Put us in the hot spots that are your most critical jobs, and put us in the other areas as you start to feel more comfortable. More people are using the product. More people are trained. Listen, I love it. I think people need to lean into it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just excited to have you on here because I'm just. We, we need some tangible, what does industry 4.0 mean to us? How do we embrace it? It's been talked about. And so to have you come on and sort of share the datanomics vision, vision of it um, and what it can be done. And I think open people's eyes to the benefits that could happen if they capture the data that's already being generated. That's right. That's already being generated. It's a raw material right there in their factories that they're not taking advantage of. That's it. I, I am it speaks for itself. I'm so happy you said that. And I'm, I, we'll say that. I'm going to go to rapid fire round of questions. I think that is the way all manufacturers need to think about it. If you walked around and you just saw, you know, aluminum or titanium just sitting around not being used, someone would be like, we have to do something with that. And these ones and zeros of data that's generating just so much you know, potential value that's just being wasted. Yes. It's, if it's not plugged in, it's just being frittered away. Yes. And if we could harness that power, we can take that raw material and make something great out of it that's going to power our businesses forward. And the last piece on this is, you brought it up, which was great, engaging the younger generation. If someone comes in mid-20s coming out of school and sees this is what we're doing, it is going to motivate and inspire that generation even more yeah. to get involved in manufacturing, which is just so critical to of, our future. Of, of course. It's a digital generation already, right? right? The use of smartphones, the comfort with digital technology, the speed at which young people are able to accrue information is mind boggling. I have three kids in their mid twenties. They can outsource me any day <laughs> of the week, right? They just figure stuff up faster. Why not play to that strength? hundred thousand percent. John, this has been awesome. I really appreciate it. I could geek out for like five hours on this IT stuff, uh, which we definitely will offline. That being said, are you ready for rapid fire round of questions? Certainly. Here we go. Red Sox or Yankees? Red Sox. There we go. Starbucks or Dunkin'? Both. Ooh, staycation or exotic destination? Definitely staycation. iPhone or Android? iPhone. Sports car or SUV? SUV. Favorite business book? Why Startups Fail, Thomas, uh, Tom Eisenman uh, just came out. Uh, I was interviewed for it a couple of years ago, so I've got a particular interest in it. And it puts a really nice context on people who are thinking about starting a, a company and where others have fallen in front of them. So I think it's a very interesting read. Why Startups Fail, making my reading list. Yeah. Um, if you had to do something other than be the CEO of Datanomics, and it could be anything, what would you do? Can I go back in time or does it have to be a shift today? Shift today. I would, uh, I really enjoy um, home building. I've done five uh, home building projects. I just finished uh, a house in Narragansett, Rhode Island. Uh, and um, I would go into renovation and uh, new construction of homes uh, in the New England area. That I, I, I take a lot of pleasure in that. It also works mental muscles that I don't work Monday through Friday. Wow. Great answer. Um, What's one thing, John, that you learned early in your career, early in your life that's helped propel you to all the success you've had? Uh, very simply, it's honesty and integrity. It's going to suit you well. Um, not being honest uh, and having integrity, you need to have a really good memory. And uh, sometimes my memory's not so good. <laughs> <laughs> Just easier to speak the truth. That's right. What's one thing that you learned later in your life or later in your career that if you could go back and tell young John, he'd listen to you? make a real positive impact on his life. Yeah, that's, that um, is connected to something I tell my kids uh, when, and their friends when they come to our home for lunch or dinner. I say, um, do you mind if it's three things? No, don't. Um, 
read everything you can about the domain that you're in before you're 30, because after 30, people are going to expect you to know it. That's number one. Number two, network with everyone you possibly can, because you never know when the next person you meet could change your life forever. And um, the third one is um, push yourself. Push yourself to take on bigger tasks, because with confidence comes achievement and accomplishment. Don't settle. Push. Always push. Buy the bigger thing because you'll grow into it. Go after the bigger job because you'll come up the learning curve on it. So those, those I'll keep it short. Those are the three things that um, I think are really important for young people. Those are really uh, very powerful. And I'm going to take a bonus question for oh, you. Here we go. Um, so I, you know, listen, you've, you've been through uh, a number of startup and scale up um, businesses. You've had ups, you've had downs as we've all had. Um, you're kind of back on the, on the cycle again. I wonder thinking about people in the audience who are in manufacturing, many of them have been doing it for a long time. Some may feel new because they're new to it, but it isn't new. What are some of the lessons you think from your experience in sort of startup struggle, scale and restart that you think they could take away from, from you that helped them? Um, I've, I think first and foremost, it's team. It's who is the team that's with you for the next phase of the journey. Let's say, for example, they're going to pivot the company in a new direction. Who's on board? Who's on that team? Uh, who's on that island, <laughs> right? Um, who do you take with you? What skills do they need to have to take you on that journey? That's, that's the first piece. It's, it's the people piece of it. The second piece of it is a, a really solid assessment of the technology that's available that's going to give you the mechanical advantage you need to play on a world stage. Um, <clears throat> I think that a lot of times uh, we think we can do a Google search and figure something out. There are experts out there like yourself who can help people understand technology faster uh, at, at more, uh, more affordably uh, with much higher uh, amounts of, of leverage. Uh, that's, that's a key piece of it. And then the third piece I would say is understand your market. Who are you selling into? I, I didn't even get a chance to talk about our product um, uh, cost, the, the true cost elements that our product provides for, for people, where we give you the exact, the true cost of what uh, machining parts uh, cost you. But um, uh, what you're able to do is look at your business, not, a, not just as a parts business, but as a portfolio. Think of your business as a portfolio. If these parts are costing me money to ship to my customer with no profit, and these parts are my money makers, why do I want to be in these parts? Look at it as a portfolio. Either raise the prices on your customers going forward because nine times out of 10, they'll accept it because they know uh, or get out of the part, right? So it's about analytics and understanding the portfolio that you're managing uh, and, and generating profit for your business on. And I talk to customers, I talk to owners about this all of the time. And you saw, that's what you saw from successes at, at you know, Max or Equalogic and so on. Th those are lessons you learned. I, I, I would say that. That's awesome. I well, John- that. It has been awesome uh, having you on. I look forward to continuing the conversation, following uh, what you guys are up to. Uh, big fan, and I look forward to much success in the future. Same here. Thank you. Made in America with Ari Santiago is brought to you by IT Direct. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and spending some time with me today. You know, my goal is to help build a community where we can learn and grow together. Your input, feedback, and engagement is critical to making that happen. Please do comment, like, and subscribe so more and more people can hear what we're doing and join our community of growth and success. Thanks so much for tuning in. Talk to you again soon.